Hey guys, we have a surprise for you. We are bringing in a new segment called Extra Ethnic. For all of our email subscribers, all you have to do to view this segment is subscribe to our newsletter and you can do that via a link in our subscription below. It's actually hard to say, but it actually trips me out. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. If I was going to get a prostitute, I would bring protection with me anyway, because I know that I'm sleeping with a prostitute. And look, I'm prostitute sorry, yeah. Dirty, Some men are reckless out there. Men. That's true. Look, this is no, true. No, Anissa, Anissa, what's the difference? <laughs> no, what's the difference between a man going to sleep with a sex worker without a condom and men who link up with people on Tinder and have no, and don't want to use a condom either. Like, I think for I some people, crazy. they're just like, I want to ride this horse bare back into the wind. <laughs> Regardless. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Yasmin. I'm Sophie Hannah. And I'm Anissa. Welcome to episode 14 of Ethnically Speaking. We are three fabulously smart, opinionated, curious and highly melanated women representing the UK. We're here to discuss everything and anything affecting our communities from current affairs to pop culture and everything in between. Nothing is off limits and we always keep it 100. So forget tiptoeing around topics and technically speaking because today we are ethnically speaking. Now Sophie, what is on your mind today? Oh, well. I'm a film buff, so I wanted to talk to you about the new French film called Cuties, which was recently released on Netflix, and it has been causing controversy from day <laughs> one. The film is about an 11-year-old black girl who rebels against her family's conservative traditions and joins a dance group against their wishes. But the film has landed Netflix in major hot water because of a poster they used to promote the film before its release. Now, some people have said that the poster shows inappropriate artwork because it shows the prepubescent girls in sexually provocative positions which is completely different to the original poster for the film that was used to promote it when it won an award earlier this year at the Sundance Film Festival. The film has now been released so there have been fresh calls to hashtag cancel Netflix on it because people are saying that it's promoting paedophilia and that is encouraging women to be taken or young girls to be taken advantage of. However, the director of the film called Mamuna Dakori, she's saying that the film is actually bringing light to this over sexualization of young girls, especially when we're looking at social media, because she's saying that the sexual images that young girls are seeing are actually encouraging them to be sexualized when they don't really understand the dangers behind it. Do you think young girls should be over sexualized within films to make a social commentary, or do you think that that is really just perpetuating the issue? And also, do you think Netflix should remove the film? And do you think you'll be boycotting the film until they do? So I actually, I saw Cuties. Um, I saw this movie. I, I accidentally avoided all of the controversy. So mm -hmm. I didn't read any okay. articles. Mm -hmm. I also accidentally avoided the Netflix poster. So I didn't see that yeah. either before I saw the film, but I, obviously knew that there was a film called Cuties causing controversy. And when I watched the film and I realized that it's a story about an immigrant girl, I presumed that, this is where I thought the film was gonna head, I presumed that the film was going to be about the, you know, the typical problematic story that we always see yeah. of like a black or brown person being restricted by their culture and only finding freedom in white Western culture. And I thought that's where the film was heading. So I was actually really happy to see that the director wasn't, the, the, the director was actually showing the oppression on both sides, you know, because this is 
a really important story about a young girl trying to navigate girlhood, but she's being yeah. exposed to two extremes of womanhood. On one side, she has people in her prayer circle saying that evil resides in the bodies of uncovered women, and that is a quote from the film. And then on the other <laughs> side, she has the girls from her school trying to speed up her adolescence, and they're all trying to find a balance between being promiscuous and being provocative before they truly understand what it like what it what it means to be either and i think the film was absolutely uncomfortable i'm not going to lie about that it okay. really was <laughs> i i watched a lot of it with my ha with my hand over my mouth there was one point where i looked over my shoulder because i didn't want people to see me <laughs> watching this film <laughs> so i'm not going to downplay the fact that it is where were you watching it luanda i was i was at home but the blinds were open <laughs> 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 oh my know, it was daytime and so the blinds were open and I thought yeah. someone was going to walk past my, like, my room and see yeah and so be like what the hell is she doing what the hell does she do in her downtime so, <laughs> <laughs> so I do like I do admit there was so, there was so much of the film that was uncomfortable but I think that was completely intentional by the director you know she, even, yeah. she interviewed um, young girls for like a year and a half and most of the scenes were based off what she found and also based off her own experience growing up in two cultures so i think it was it like absolutely intentionally um you know make to made to make us queasy and i think that she did that i think she achieved her goal because i was very uncomfortable watching the film <laughs> Well, the ones that I honestly congratulate you for even getting far to the film because I because honestly I watched the clip and I couldn't even go the full way through the clip. I just I could not do it. Like it was like hands over eyes. Like I can't believe I'm watching this. I can't believe I'm watching this. And I just had to just 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 shut it off. And it made me really think. Like, do I think that this is doing more good than harm? It's tough and it's almost, I, I'm almost a bit biased in what I'm about to say because I haven't watched the film. So I don't watch the mm -hmm. story all the way through to its end. But for me, just of the initial things that I saw, I didn't see the, the I didn't see that much of the good that I was seeing, if that makes any sense. I just thought it was too overtly sexual, like not even for, for young girls, it was, you know, strong. But even if it was like girls my age, I'd be like, oh my gosh, like this feels strong for me. Like this feels like a lot. Um, so do I think it was over-sexualized? Yes. Do I think it's going to perpetuate the issue? Yes. But what I think the benefit of it perpetuating the issue will be, it will open discussion up to the, how we sexualize young girls. Will I cancel Netflix? I don't think so. And I don't know if that's controversial <laughs> to say. I don't know if that's controversial to say. I don't think I'm... Because Netflix have done some shady other things in the past and I haven't canceled them yet. So I've just lived with that. I'm just not going to cancel them at the moment yeah i think for me i'm not cancelling netflix whatsoever <laughs> i just i'm so sick of cancel culture i'm just i'm so exasperated by it because oh, i don't word. like one two three four programs that netflix is doing so i'm gonna cancel my subscription they mm -hmm. do thousands upon thousands of different things for different audiences and to cancel them because of one thing i might be unhappy about i think it's just showing that we're not going in a good place for cancel culture mm -hmm. that's my personal view in terms of cuties i've seen it as well i think it is a very good film this director did a really good job on showing the story and i think that's the issue that we have when people are floating around three minutes of it and trying to say look how terrible it is mm -hmm. if you look at the film it's perfectly in context like it makes sense and the scenes of them being over sexualized when they're dancing are probably three or four the rest of it is really talking about this girl, as Luanda said, trying to find her identity between two different worlds that she feels equally a part of. One is her, her birth heritage and one is the country she now lives in. So, yeah, I just, I, but I wonder, because I have to ask you ladies this, they're saying it's over-sexualized because it's young girls, so we shouldn't be seeing that, even if it's a social commentary. That's what some people are saying. But what about when it's rape scenes that they're reenacting on TV, drug use? violence all of those are seen and that's not perpetuating we're not perpetuating rape by showing rape but when we sh when we're seeing what young girls are having to see on the daily 
then suddenly we're promoting it. So mm. where's Sophie, the line? Yes, yeah, Sophie, I'm sorry not to cut you off, Luanda. I'm going to jump on the no, line no, go there. Ahead. Because it's like, I, I understand what you're saying, but for me in that it being over-sexualized wasn't even just the film itself, because obviously I haven't watched it, so it wasn't just the trailer itself. It was to me, the way it was being marketed to me felt over-sexualized. <laughs> like we know that sex sells. So obviously in France, they used a completely different poster to how they used in America. In America, we saw the girls in a few more overtly sexual positions, even even the um, summary of the movie was different. It wasn't about this girl. They changed it later to say, she, you know, she's obsessed with a free-spirited dance crew. But before it was, she was obsessed with a dance crew who twerks. And for me, it was like, it was purposefully done that way because sex sells. And even when it's yeah. a small child, it's still selling. So for me, it was like, that's the bit that was really over-sexualized for me as well, not just the movie itself, because obviously I haven't watched it, it was the way it was being packaged to me, like this is something young and sexy for the little sexy girl. It was weird. I, I just think the whole thing is weird. So for me, with like what you're saying, with rape, when rape and like drug use and even just abuse is being portrayed in film, I don't think it's perpetuating it because I think it's allowing the story to tell the story. I think they don't market it to be like, oh my gosh, like this is abuse, like everyone can watch this. I think the way that movie was marketed in America is what's going to perpetuate the over sexualization of young girls. I think the market marketing of it has to be put in Netflix's door because they're the one who changed the poster. Yeah, so that's yeah. their door. Yeah, yeah. The, the film didn't do that. But for me, in terms of the girls and the issues it raises, I think that we like to draw a line to say young girls aren't being sexualized or seeing sexualized images. What about Kylie when she was with Tiger and she was a child? What about <laughs> oh Britney God. Spears when she first came out with Hit Me Baby One More Time and she was she wearing was like a, a, a yeah, she was a child. and a bra. Oh she was a child she was a and they were like, oh, it's that hot down in the though. South. This is what we wear. That was, that like was all of these things are sexualizing children. But when we do a film that actually talks about it, suddenly we're like, yeah. this is just too yeah. far. We should have yeah. stopped it in the beginning. Really, is my thought. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think this is this actually like speaks a lot to it because these young girls in the films that they will be looking at the Instagrams of Kylie. Um, if it yep. was you know the nineties, they would have been listening to Britney Spears, and that's the whole point. I think in terms of the question that you asked when you said, is it okay for young girls to reenact being overly sexual for the purposes yeah. of social commentary i think that is a question that needs to be answered on a case-by-case -case basis okay. because this is a director who is a woman who mm -hmm. like i said is trying to put her story her own yeah. childhood story along with the real interviews of real young girls growing up in 2020 into this film i would feel you know a little bit differently if it, if it didn't have a purpose, it matters to me how these young girls were treated on set. It matters mm -hmm. to me yeah. who who is in the positions of power and it matters what story are you trying to tell with your art and why. Yeah. So all of those things, for me, they, they come into play into my mind. But I agree with you, Anissa, in, in terms of the marketing. That was <laughs> wild. It was weird. That was yeah. so wrong. Yeah. But to be completely transparent, the director of the film, who also wrote the film, she saw the poster when we did. She did not approve this. Mm. They did not ask for her permission. This was not something that she wanted to change. And so if you look at the original poster from France, it, it, it shows you that this is going to be a story of young girls trying to find their freedom and trying yeah. to find their womanhood because they're running freely through the town with bras and underwears and it, it, it's showing you exactly what you're gonna get in the film. With the Netflix poster, which I luckily didn't see before I watched the <laughs> film, because I might have been on, I might have been in the boat with you, honestly, I might have been like, this isn't for me. I would have yeah. just closed it down straight away and not even clicked on it. So I was lucky that I missed it before I watched the film, but that poster, is, it, it says this is going to be like a sexy step up, but for preteens. Yes. Yeah. And so of course yeah. everyone's outrage was completely correct because what kind of messaging is that? What kind of marketing is that? And also because of how delicate the film is and how intentional she was with everything that she did, the yeah. marketing needs to be that same way as well. So I think they did I a just disservice wanna, to okay. her. 
I just want to step in, like, specifically about something that I read about the people, a lot of the people who are actually complaining. So they said that Netflix is known for being left-leaning in terms of politics, so they're much more on the liberal side. And they're saying a lot of Republicans don't like the fact, the power that Netflix has and the fact they're so far leaning to the left. So a lot of the people complaining are far-right Republicans. People who are talking about it's child pornography, it's this, it's that, it's Republican commentators, it's far-right publications. They're the ones who are saying that we need to investigate Netflix for this and we need to investigate to get Netflix for that. And for me, it just feels like another political tool to kind of get their agenda across because one of the guys, Republican Ted Cruz, wrote a letter to the district attorney saying they want Netflix to be brought up on charges of child pornography because one oh teen, gosh. no, one preteen shows her bare chested breast or nipple. That is not true whatsoever. And he yeah, has now it, had to yeah. walk back that statement saying, oh, he's sorry. The man hadn't even seen the film, but he so jumped on this as a tool to try and bring down Netflix. So I think also there's a lot going on behind the scenes as to why so many specific types of people mm-hmm. actually want to cancel Netflix because I think it's going to fund their agenda. Yeah, I, I, I feel that. And to be fair to Netflix, like Netflix did apologise for the post there and they actually even called the director up personally to apologise yeah. as well. But in terms of right wing, left wing, it's interesting to me that this film has come from France because <laughs> France is more liberal than England. And if you think about something like, you know, the, uh, a couple of years ago when we had that scandal of that school teacher who was sleeping with that student mm. and she was 15. I mean, that happens a lot. So yeah, you're going to have to be real specific. It was an exposed one. It was a more exposed one because okay. he had a name and there was a song written about Like there was a whole, oh my gosh. It, was, it was a lot bigger than the usual ones. I know it's quite common, but it was big. And they ran away way together to France because they know that the legal age of consent is lower there and when you know we had blurred lines and we had those models with the breath their yep. bare breasts in one version of the music video and then covered up in the version that we saw in England the bare breast version was played in France day and night doesn't matter what time it is so I think there is a lot to say for people um, in terms of control who would rather ignore the conversations and just say this is bad because all of the things that you don't like child pornography and the over sexualization of young girls the creator of this film is encouraging a conversation about it she also doesn't like those same things which is why she's made the movie but people are judging it before they've even seen the film and to be honest if i was someone who saw the poster and someone who saw those clips before i'd seen the movie i might feel the same way yeah, that's exactly why I said I was biased because I haven't I haven't watched the movie, so I can't say for sure yes or no. I can only say of what I've seen and what I saw was like, oh no, this isn't good. But but it opens up conversation, so I agree on that. What I wanted to just add on to that as well is that why aren't we more, more concerned with actually tackling child pornography and paedophilia right. than jumping on this film? Jeffrey Epstein, <laughs> um, Prince Andrew, um, Jimmy <laughs> Savile, all these people who have had proven for some cases and other people very questionable but a lot of truth seems to be coming out so some of it is alleged I want to say that very clearly but why aren't we so concerned with tackling these people who are actually doing this rather than the film that is trying to bring light to it it is a black Senegalese immigrant woman who made this film and they are dragging her but when we have men who have money and they're white and they have penises then suddenly we're not so concerned with child pornography and paedophilia so there's a lot going on here yeah I I agree with you and obviously I was an on set of the film and I can't find any interviews with the young girls but from the behind the scenes footage that I've seen and from the interviews from the director it sounds like they all had like a like a very mentoring relationship with them mm-hmm. you know they played games on set they were absolutely like from the small things that I've seen it it seems as if they were taken care of but since you mentioned royals <laughs> and since you mentioned Netflix <laughs> <laughs> It has uh, been spoken about recently that Harry and Meghan have signed a multi-year mm-hmm. deal with Netflix. So I'm definitely interested to see the type of content that they will be creating. Um, and of course, the royal couple are stepping away from being a royal couple and they want to earn money outside of the control of the crown. Which brings me to the thought of how necessary the crown is Mm. in the 21st century do we feel like we need the monarchy or is it time that we followed the rest of our fellow european countries and just let it go (laughs) i i think that i have a a bit of an unpopular opinion on this now do i think that the royals 
do anything or contribute to make society better in regards to like my personal life not per se um but would <laughs> i want to would i want to get rid of them no and the reason why i say no and i know it's crazy it's just because it's like having a monarchy it's like our legacy in britain like we have the royals it's our thing it's such a british thing and it makes me like you know, really hold on to, you know, my Britishness. When, when do I ever say that? My Britishness, but you know. Uh, it makes me really hold on to my Britishness thinking like, oh my gosh, we have a, a queen and we've got prince and princesses. And I know they don't do anything, but I just like the idea of having that legacy around. And I think, you know, the modern day royals, they're stepping out, they're doing a lot of, you know, community and outreach work. And even though it doesn't directly affect me, they're still helping people. <laughs> um, so, I mean, for me, they, and I know it might be the one to say, to me, they do, they do more good than harm, really, to me. So I, I wouldn't really want to get rid of them. And that's my opinion. I quite like them. And Lisa, you stand firm in that. You I don't do. say I that like half-heartedly. Them. You say it wholeheartedly. I, I don't want to a legacy. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank me you personally, for being here today. <laughs> I don't really mind the royals, to be honest. Um, like, I'm not really that fussed either way. I think it, like, if I really thought about it, I agree that they don't do anything to my daily life, but they do also do do things, um, I think, for the society. So for example, they say that the, lo- the royals live off 85 million a year that we give to them from our taxes, 85 million. But they said it works out to like 1.94p, one pound 94p per person. So it's not the most amount of money, but they say that they actually bring in 550 million through tourism. So people that come over to see Buckingham Palace and to come and see this and that and whatever. So they are helping the economy in that sense. And I feel that, I feel like they, we did a misdeed with what we did with Meghan because she could have given a face to the new type of royal. This is someone who was mixed raced. She was divorced. She wasn't born in the UK. If they really wanted to push forward the monarchy and show that actually we do represent the people, look, we're kind of diverse, diverse. They could have done that with Meghan. So I think that they, they really missed an opportunity there. But I think that, yeah, for me, I'm happy to keep them. I'm really not that fussed. I, yeah, I don't have any passionate feelings for the royal family on either end of the spectrum. No way. No, honestly, (laughs) honestly, no. Luanda, I was sure, I was like, I will eat my hat if Luanda isn't like, like the French, we need to cut their heads off, start a revolution. (laughs) Honestly, I'm so shocked. I'm so shocked. I'm not going to lie, I wasn't expecting you to say what you said about cuties. So <laughs> I wasn't really? I was really because I thought you was gonna be save the children. <laughs> <laughs> so we we're, we're, we're all full of surprises today. Yep. But it's, it's shaking it up me, today. The reason why I'm not like a monarchist or a person that despises them is because in terms of everything that we know about their lives, they just seem so controlled, so restricted, mm, yeah. and it seems quite depressing to mm-hmm. be completely honest and so in light of the fact that the royal family don't have any political power nowadays it yeah. just feels like to me there are a, a lot of members of the royal family that go through more pain than the job is worth like you don't really get to speak your mind or be yourself or love who you love and there's so many issues involved in in that when you do like we all saw what happened Let's not go there. But you, you, <laughs> but you, but you know what I mean. But I think in terms of their contributions to society, I think that we could, um, I think we could drastically reduce their income because the royal family have three sources of income, and one of which is the sovereign state. I yeah, I, I was just talking correctly. about that. Mm-hmm. So they get like yeah. eighty-five million in. Yeah. Exactly. And so that is money that we could be using a lot more communally. Because the thing that frustrates me is when we have national tragedies or when we just have people going about their everyday lives Mm -hmm. that are struggling or something that we need to pay for or like even not even to bring up Grenfell, but 
that is something that mm -hmm. didn't need to happen. And then when we try to prevent these kind of things, when people go to their councils, they're ignored or they're told that we don't have the money. Yeah. When we do, mm -hmm. because we've seen the royal weddings and we see you eating in the palace. So it's like, <laughs> it, we see it, you know? And so for me, I feel like, I don't want to hear that lie again about how we can't help the masses because we don't have the money when all of the masses are paying their taxes towards seven people living in lavish luxury and I don't even okay. think <laughs> what it's actually more than seven people so it's not just I the know, queen and like, then, it's, it's all of them and I was saying like broken down it's £1.94 per person in the UK that they that. get of our money I know that so, so they want to say they want to say that to us to make it seem like not a lot but if it's going to be not, not a lot, lot then we can but Sophie mm -hmm. if we're going to be taken £1 not, like it, I think it was like £1.24 that I read in the article if we're going to be taking that amount from every single person in the country, we can mm -hmm. be using it for something else. Because, like I said, if we I take don't this think away, that they would use it for anyone else, Luanda. Let's be honest. The same thing when we were said we were going to leave the European Union and was it Boris's whole thing was like, if we leave, there's 400 million that we could be pumping into the NHS. If that 85 million, if we got rid of the monarchy, that money is still probably not going to go to the people. They're going to find some budget, something else where that money can disappear into. Because I think, I think ideally, and I'm not against you in terms of there is money, but I don't think that we would have any more access to that money if we got rid of the monarchy. Well, if we did it in a structural way that people were involved who actually cared about this stuff, then it could. But I'm just like, even if we took that away from them, there are still two other sources of income. Like, you would still be, like, richer than the rest of us. You would still yeah. be um, living the life that you want to lead. You will still be protected. But we could cr put systems in place that help more people than just the people in Buckingham Palace, is my point. Yeah. Yeah. But I think they are also helping as well because if you think about something like the Prince's Trust, which is something I think Prince Charles started, and yeah. a lot of people have benefited from that. A lot of actors, a lot of artists. So Idris Elba, he was just like, it was a Prince's Trust that paid for him to go on like an acting course or something like that mm -hmm. and enabled him to start making steps into the career he's into now. There's also what um, the, what was it the games that, um, the Victor's Games. Okay. that Prince Harry does for ex-soldiers who have lost limbs and now it's kind of like their Olympics oh, that they have for that. That's something that he started. They also starting to do things with mental health. So they are doing things and I think definitely the younger royals are trying to do a bit more. Like Kate just had this photo competition where she was highlighting different images from this year and one of them was from a Black Lives Matter protest. So I think there are little things that they are doing to kind of step up. But I agree with you, Luanda, in that they're so restricted, they're never going to be able to come out and say exactly how they want to support or who they want to support or whatever. So I think it's tough. I think it's, I think it's really tough. And I just like... I, I, not that I have a particular affinity to any royal, but I just like the idea of us having royals. But when you're we're putting in, and I'm thinking about the income and how much money goes into them, like when, like now, just thinking about it in hindsight, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like we could take that 85 million and use it to try to eradicate homelessness, but instead we're, you know, paying for other people. So when I start to put it in perspective, then I'm like, oh my Literally. gosh, this is, like this is horrible. But then at the same time, I'm with Sophie was saying that you know what, actually, even if we had that money, would they even use it to do the right thing? I don't know. So for me, I'm like, I would, if somebody suggested that the royals got a pay cut, I'd be all for it. I'd say fair enough if we're re, uh, like redistributing the money throughout the country. But to get rid of them altogether, I'm still at no, let's keep them. But a pay cut is where I'm at. I'm, I'm here for the pay cut. Because they have no political power. It's not really like they do too yeah. much to govern the country. Yeah. But yeah. if we cut at least a little bit of the purse strings, you know what I mean? Then, mm. and I'm here for the yeah. I'm cutting for the first drinks. There we go. There I'm here for the drastic downsizing. I'm here for the drastic downsizing. Not drastic, but but drastic, honey. <laughs> cut it by a third. By a third. <laughs> By but I think this is, at least. I think this is the thing, because what do you guys think about it from this angle? Because I read in an article, I think it was like national interest or national history or something, but they were saying how having a monarchy allows the culture to still have this ideology that there are people who are born better than Ooh. other people. And they're saying this is one of the reasons why they're saying we need to do away with it, because they're like, to say that because of the family that you're fortunate enough to be born into not counting your intelligence or your qualification, then suddenly you're fit to sit on the throne and to rule people. Now, 
My issue on that was twofold because one, I'm just like, I don't think Boris is intelligent or qualified really? and he rules our country. <laughs> so it's not just the royals. But what do you guys think about that? Do you think that it still has the ideology that some people are better than others in the country by well, having royals? I think it depends on what better means to you, if that makes sense to me. Like, I can't have that ideology if better to me doesn't mean wealth does that does that make sense so if no was, that makes sense yeah so if i was still under the ideology that everything is better with money then i'd be like yeah okay they're still perpetuating a certain thing that you, you you have to be born to be you have to be born special or born in a certain way for me when i look at the royals i don't think that's a better family because i honey i still feel like they've got all the secrets in the in the cupboard and all sorts of crazy <laughs> things going on i don't feel like this is a happy functional family so it doesn't feel better to me um so for me it doesn't reinforce that ideology because better doesn't mean wealth to me so that's what i say but there's there's different layers to it though anisa yeah. so like for example if they were to enter into the army they automatically enter um ranks above their peers when they haven't done the yeah. work to get there and there's, there's there's a lot of things like that I so like if you were someone i feel like that's more privileged though than better like you've born that's... to a privileged family yeah, yeah hierarchy of privilege. Uh, mm, I feel like the words are wanna... interchangeable for me. <laughs> I feel like they're different for me. They're not interchangeable for me. Sorry. Go, what, sorry what, no, 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 no. In what way? Like... like better and privileged isn't... Because for me, privileged, we can black and white and say, objectively, this person is privileged. But better is so subjective to the person who beholds the better. Do you know what I mean by that? So I can't say yeah. that privilege. I, so for me, it's privilege that they can do that. Does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah, no, no. I think I think I no, know. That makes sense. I think I know what you're saying, yeah. but I think for the most part, like the global consensus consensus would be that privilege equates to having better things. Mm, you know. Okay. Okay. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. But I mm, I just think even like how earlier Sophie you were talking about oh the royals do this and the charity work and blah 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 <laughs> like it is no 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 but like it is yeah. part of the duty like it is part of the job description it's not because like kate middleton didn't wake up one day and was like i can't wait to post that picture of the black lives matter protest like it is part of your mm. duty as a duchess to be doing this charity work and i just think i don't know what kind of lives these people would be leading if they had the freedom of choice to um to be with who they wanted to be with and not not being with someone who's acceptable or saying what they want to say and not having to be neutral and literally every political topic. So I think that the reason why I'm not so like angry at the monarchy is because I don't want to live a life like that, I guess. Yeah, but I, I guess for me, I think in the charity work that they do, they show the things that they feel are talking points. And that is my opinion. <laughs> so it's not based on anything, but <laughs> them picking mental health charities, them picking sold charities for soldiers who've been injured, um, photography that speaks to the current state of the world. I know that they don't probably get a lot of say in the amount of things that they do, but I have seen somewhere that they are allowed to kind of pick the charities that they want to focus on so i'm glad that they're picking charities that are actually speaking to various needs because they could have been picking charities that only benefit their friends who are making millions and millions and millions but they're choosing to bring light to issues that i feel are kind of being experienced by people who don't who haven't just been bought been to people who haven't just been born into privilege so I'm going to take a moment to pause right here and say thank you so much for what you've seen so far. If you've enjoyed what you've liked, make sure you are liking it wherever you are watching or listening us, at, listening to us. And if you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. So we've spoken about a controversial Netflix film, Cuties, and also whether we still need the royals in Britain today. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit, if that's okay with you lovely ladies. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about this young lady. Her name's Jessica Heyer. She is a former student sex worker, and she's recently started a charity called Support for Student Sex Workers. And this is after experiencing isolation and suicidal thoughts from being forced into sex work, and then also being turned away from mental health services. So the aim of the charity is basically to reduce the stigma around sex work and also to give professional support to those who are working in the industry. Now sex work in the UK is actually on the rise with more people struggling to make ends meet during the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. While it's not illegal for an individual to buy or sell sex from each other in the UK, soliciting and sex work 
uh, sex workers banding together as a group is illegal. So last year, a human rights charity, they did a study and they're called Rights Info. They found that actually 49% of British people were in favour of decriminalising brothel keeping. So my question to you ladies is, do you think sex work in the UK should be decriminalised and why? This is a juicy one, guys. So I think... <sighs> I think whether people want to keep it a criminal offence for like brothel keeping and soliciting or whether they want to decriminalise it really comes down to a lot of people's personal opinion surrounding sex work. Because I think that's what is influencing because people said there were stigmas. And I saw this really great quote on Open Society's Foundation and it really spoke to me. It said, the fact that sex work is work does not mean that it's good work, empowering work or harmless work. And that really spoke to me because I, I would say personally, in terms of sex work, sex work, I'm not really here for it. Like, I think that personally the body is sacred and selling your body or selling your services to guys, it's just, it's just not something that I'm really, <sighs> that I would do. Let me speak for myself. But I do think that sex work should be decriminalised because for women who do make that choice, they should not be put in harm's way. Mm. Um, they're women who do sex work, are, or sorry, people who do sex work, because it's men, women, trans people, they are 12 times more likely to die because of the work that they do. When they say brothel keeping, the law is so vague around it. It can be literally mm. two people working together. So one woman looking out for another woman and they're both sex workers, that's a brothel, they could go to prison for years and years and years and years. And I think we need to start making it safer for women. And if that means classing it as work and giving them rights so that they can report things to the police and not face the stigma and access health services, then I'm all for it, apart from what my personal opinion might be on it. I definitely agree with you um, in terms of, like, I think we have the same issues with it because my biggest problem is that the criminalization of sex work in the uk is such a legal gray area and yeah. when people mm -hmm. when especially women when they try to put um things in place for their safety it actually turns out that they're breaking the law so going back to the brothel thing because you could have women who team up to keep each other safe but mm -hmm. if there are more if there's more than one person in a household selling sex that is considered a brothel by law and then it's illegal yeah. and so you put yeah. yourself in danger but mm -hmm. i think that if we were to decriminalize, decriminalize sex work, I think it would actually make it easier to keep people safe because obviously yeah. these laws originally were designed to help people in theory, but in practice mm. it's actually doing the opposite thing. So like for example, if you have um, women who want to report robbery or want to report sexual assault nine times out of ten if they're a sex worker they're not going to do it because mm. they're scared of being arrested yeah. themselves um yeah. when i read the story of the student like it genuinely broke my heart like i was genuinely so upset reading um the article and watching the video on her because she when she was she there was a period of her, her life where she was forced to do this she didn't want to do it this yeah, was like, yeah. without consent yeah she went for help she said that she was severely depressed and she went to mental health institutions for help she told them i'm about to go home and sleep yeah. with a man for money and i don't want to do it and she said mm -hmm. she told them that she was suicidal because she was a sex worker she was discharged from two therapists and i think that is so wrong i think that should be yeah. illegal you can't just hear that someone's being abused or hear that someone's suicidal and let them go so i think it truly is a miracle that she's still alive today and still able to turn her trauma into something positive for other sex yeah. workers because i think um again like you said sophie a lot of people um, a lot of people's opinions on it comes down to how they view sex work yeah. so if you had a child if you had a girl a student who said i'm about to go home um and be sexually assaulted by 
a person and there was no money involved, you'd absolutely step in to help her. If yeah. you had a student who said, I'm suicidal, you'd absolutely mm. step in to help them. But because mm -hmm. they knew that she was a sex worker, she was treated like less of a person. And I think this dehumanization of sex workers is what perpetrates so much um, sexual assault and so much murder. And I think we really need to take like a big step back as a, as a society and listen to what sex workers are telling us will make them safer. Yeah. yeah, I agree I with you, girl. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. And I, I, like you guys have both said, I share the sentiment in it's, it's almost hard to speak on this without my personal opinion because personally, I wouldn't, I would never well, like Well, sex support... is so personal. That's the point. Yeah, isn't exactly. It? It's so yeah. personal. It's so intimate. And so for me, it's like, I would never encourage someone to be a sex worker like i just wouldn't if my friend said hey girl this is what i'm about to go do whoop -de -whoop -de -whoop, i wouldn't be like yeah girl, go do that <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't i wouldn't be like yeah you should go and do that i i 100 would be like why would why would you be doing this just for me i it's, it's just not for me um however i am here though for women men anyone being able to work in a safe Space and not being put um, at threat or at harm and things like that. And when I was reading, I um, read quite interestingly um, about the Nordic model. So what they do basically is that they're instead of criminalizing or you know persecuting the sex worker, it's really their client or possibly, for lack of better words, their pimp who that who gets criminalized or who gets persecuted. And of course, that comes with its pros and cons. One that the sex worker doesn't get stigmatized, so that's the pro. But the con is if you are now persecuting their clients or their pimp, then that means that they have like a shortage of income. So I almost feel like there's no way to win in anything with the sex work because it's all so great, like you were saying, Nuanda. Yeah. It's and tough. I think in terms of the Nordic model, it's actually been shown not to work. So they mm. introduced it in Ireland, Sweden, Canada, and in all of those countries, they were saying it actually didn't make sex workers safer. That's what sex workers said, yeah. because they're saying the clients usually become more violent because they know now a sex worker can put them in a vulnerable position to get them arrested yeah. or whatever. Even if they're not going to, the fear is there and then the clients take it out on the sex workers. Whereas in New Zealand, where they decriminalise sex work or various things like soliciting or brothel keeping around sex work, because like you said, it is legal to be able to trade sex on an individual basis yeah. for money. They're saying when they did it in New Zealand, the sex worker said it had a positive impact because they felt now they could refuse clients. Um, mm -hmm. because the law was behind them. They could insist that clients wear condoms because they now had the law behind them and they said they had better relationships with the police and felt that they could talk about instances where they had been assaulted because now they were no longer seen as somebody to throw in prison but someone who the law is now saying that you protect. So that's why I think it's so important that we really revisit this and take our personal opinions out of it because yeah. why aren't we looking at the laws in the UK that have made it so difficult to live that some women feel that their only option is to sell their body or sell their sexual services in order to make money. They said there are a lot of mothers who are now doing it because times have gotten so hard due to the austerity government and now the pandemic. Mm. We don't want to tackle that. <laughs> we don't want to tackle <laughs> poverty, but we want to tell them we're going to throw you in prison if two of you are working together to keep safe. Right. I am, um, um, wow, well done to New Zealand, first of all. And um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, read an I read an article that said something along the lines of there shouldn't be a government that dictates between two consenting adults who they should have sex with and on what terms. And I found it really funny when I read it, but it's also really, really true. And I think that if we were to decriminalise sex work, it would make us easy, it would make it easier to find children because imagine if you are in like a brothel situation and it's illegal mm -hmm. for you to be in, uh, in that situation anyway and then they bring in a new girl in the room next to you and she looks 17 and maybe you find out that she is and you can't say anything because they're going to ask you how do you know this what's the address yeah. and then you're also going to jail so i think that like m the most important thing for me is to protect kids and mm -hmm. to protect people who aren't consenting, people who are um, involved in the sex work against their will, which is yeah. like yeah. the most horrific thing I could ever think of. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the police, because you mentioned about um, them having better relationships with the police, Sophie, 
yeah. there are there have been a lot of cases of abuse where the police either like force them to have sex with mm. them um so yeah. that they won't get arrested or confiscate their assets so they actually legally are able to take the earnings so you could go to jail and have your money legally taken from you and there are no reports to where this money mm. goes and a lot of the times they presume that the the like sometimes there's immigrant women the immigrant women that get arrested for prostitution the money that has been confiscated then is put towards deporting them to countries yeah, that aren't gosh. safe that it's is crazy that, that is, is absolutely horrible. wild but is- um also, Sophie said something about condoms, and I read a couple of things which really I, confused my brain. Confused okay. my brain because there was one website that I was on, which was um, a website that was for the protection of prostitutions, and they talked yeah. about don't make it easy for the police, don't carry condoms, and don't carry your work clothes. And then oh. I read another article that said there was a prosecutor who um, actually was able to move the case forward by proving that this woman was a sex worker because she was in possession of condoms. And so since then, a lot of sex workers have been too scared to carry them and have of course been contracting STIs. But in my my mind, if you pull me over and you think that I'm a sex worker and I have like lingerie and condoms in my car, how does that prove anything? Because In my head, smart people carry condoms anyway. And if you, so well, maybe if maybe it's how maybe it's how many. Them, but I think met them. Well, exactly because yeah, they yeah. could have like they could have chatted them up and then they have this. But I guess my yeah. thing is with the condoms. I think it brings it to a really good position in terms of health, and that by mm. decriminalizing it, you allow women, trans people, men in all enabled to be able to have better health and to they saying that when you bring in these laws to support sex workers and the work that they do hiv and aids goes down because the world health organization Mm. said in 2012 we should be um making laws to put sex work as work because they're like it actually decreases disease and stds yeah. and hiv and, and AIDS murders because and sexual assault and murders because you're saying <laughs> if women are not carrying condoms and they're sleeping with a few men, or men are not carrying condoms, and they're condoms, sleeping yes. with a few clients oh, through the night, and you don't know how many other people these clients have slept with, we're yeah. saying that that's less of a risk than two women. It just, it doesn't make, it just doesn't Sorry, make any sense to me. I, I, I know this is actually hard to say, but it actually trips me out. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, if I was going to get a prostitute, I would bring protection with me anyway because I know that I'm sleeping with a prostitute. And look, I'm prostitute sorry, yeah. Dirty, Some like, men are reckless out there. Men, that's true. Look, this is no, Anissa, Anissa, what's the difference? <laughs> no, what's the difference between a man going to sleep with a sex worker without a condom and men who link up with people on Tinder and have no, and don't want to use a condom either. Like, I think for some people, they're just like, I want to ride this horse bare back into the wind, (laughs) regardless. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that, guys. I'm so sorry. (laughs) This has been the best moment for me. (laughs) All the shows that we've done is Sophie saying, riding the horse bare back into the wind. (laughs) (laughs) Must watch. Please come again. Oh, gosh. We need to do like a (laughs) bloopers reel. Mm. (laughs) But I think it's... I would say about the sex work, I read an article and it was saying that a lot of women get involved because I don't want to, again, come from the sex work angle because they said a lot of women or many women who do it do do it because of poverty some women do it because they're saying it's better pay fewer hours more flexibility and some women or people do it because it says it helps them to express themselves sexually so there are a variety of people because i don't want us to paint the one image that they're all destitute migrant immigrants mm. who have no other way to kind of live their life yeah. it is a very some very vast just, pool of people yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. not it's it's just it's just really tough for me because I just yeah, it's really tough for me. It's really tough. I just want I'm just 
the bottom line for me is I just hope everybody is safe and stays safe. A hundred percent. That is the, bottom, that yeah. is the yes. bottom line for me. I just hope everybody um, stays safe. Now, of course, um, a lot of people get into sex work for different reasons and change a lot about themselves. So I've got another question, a little bit different, of, but similar about change, but switching gears just a little bit. So, ladies, I want to know, would you ever convert religion to be with the person you love? Hmm. So, <laughs> so Sophie, I'm sure you can guess what I'm going to say on this. You'll be right this time. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no! <laughs> I'm, I'm actually interested to see what she's going to say. <laughs> I was going to say maybe yes, but I could be wrong. So, what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> way. I the one who got down for that one, I'm telling I, you. No, I really thought the would be like, yes, sorry, but go ahead. What? Girl, how have we been this, this many what? episodes Anita? deep and you still don't know Luanda? <laughs> I think the ideal that I've got of you in relation... You know what, go explain, go. No, no, say, 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 say. The idea that I have of you and relationships or the way that you almost, you know, conduct relationships is that, you know, you're an all in kind of person and that you're not really fixed onto anything you're free flowing so that even if it was like okay if this guy this is all an example obviously hypothetical but if this was the guy and you in love and he has religion but and he's shown it to you and it's so beautiful but you would be like yeah okay that, so that, that's <laughs> i appreciate that that point of view for that sure what i thought um <laughs> i think for me probably the the, the biggest issue would be how we're going to raise our children because i think if i am marrying yep. a person where it is so important for them that i convert to their religion then i'm going to presume that they also want to raise their children mm. like this as well but yep. i don't even if i was to um because i'm not religious at present but even if i was to later become religious i still don't think that i would bring my children up in the religion that I choose because when you know when I was growing up I remember asking my mom about God and religion and all that stuff and asked her what she believed and what religion she was and she answered me honestly but she also told me that I don't need to believe what she believes just because she believes it and mm -hmm. I've never been forced to believe something I've always been given the freedom um, to be free thinking well, as you can tell, it's resulted in who I am today. <laughs> um, but I've always been given the freedom of choice. And I think I'd like to extend that courtesy to my children as well. So if I was dating someone and it was very important for them, to them, for me to convert, I, it would worry me that this is what they want for our kids. And I can't see myself doing that. Yeah, I, I fully get that. And I think for me, I wouldn't convert to someone's religion because... I am so deep within my own religion, so I wouldn't leave it behind for somebody else because it's so important to my way of life that I couldn't I couldn't give it up. And I wouldn't date someone from another religion either because I would want us to have some sort of um, shared values, like Luanda said, in our, within our household, just as a married couple, but yeah. also when it comes to children. Um, and it doesn't even mean if you're from the same faith or the same religion that you're even going to agree on everything. Me and my husband are from the same religion, the same <laughs> denomination of Christianity, and there are still things that we're just like, if we had children, we do not see eye to eye on. Mm. We're just like, really? he was like, based, yeah, there's still some things that, I'm just kind of like, I'd be quite relaxed about that. And he's just kind of like, nope, not going to run, not going to happen. I'm like, <laughs> really? we're going to need to talk about this because I just don't big, care that big much. big things or small things that you could let go of? Or? Um, it would, I would have to really understand his point of view because for me, yeah. religion is, sometimes I think it gets a bad rap and my religion is very enjoyable to me. And when people and when children specifically grow up in, I can speak for myself, growing up in Christianity and it was probably quite conservative um, denomination, for a lot of people, they play, p placed so many restrictions on their children and Christianity or their religion came about what you don't do. You don't do this, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't rave, you don't sex, you don't... It's all these lists. And for me, I don't want children to be so restricted that they don't see the joy in the religion. So I'm probably a lot more free spirited than my husband is and something he's just like, you're way too out of the boat. But I'm just like, hey, I feel like children should be able to feel like it's enjoyable because people don't do things they don't enjoy. So 
Yeah, I, that's I'm true. kind of like I'm not saying trying to make a child um, not enjoy what they're going to do when mm. it comes to religion. And then when they get to an age that they can make their own decision, hopefully I've showed it to be so enjoyable. They're like, I really want to keep this as part of my life. And if they don't, mm. they're an adult now, and that's their decision. Yeah, that sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I'm with you guys as well. I wouldn't. Uh, I w yeah, I wouldn't convert religion. Um, what one because I just don't think it'd be real on my part. I'm just gonna be absolutely yeah. honest. Like if somebody said to me, it was like, hey, Nisa, I'd just be like, oh, okay. But like I, I, I wouldn't. It just would not be real. And it's I would know in yeah. the back of my heart that I was always doing it for man, and it was just kind of like, <laughs> you're like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's not. It wouldn't be serious to me. And I'm being like dead yeah. honest. It would not be serious to me. I'd be like, okay, I'm doing it for man. Like, okay, do you know yeah. what I mean? And I think you know, I've had like. A, I guess a blend of both of I guess Sophie's ex experience and Luan's experience in regards to religion you know like my parents you know they both believed in God but they they didn't go to church do you know what I mean and I found my faith my own way um and I got introduced to God my own way and that and that was how I kind of um had my religion and I'm so grounded in mind like I have Sophie um same sentiment that you've shared, Sophie. So I would never convert because I strongly believe in what I'm doing or what's going on in my life, but I can't start yeah. to believe in what this man has told me. Um, so it's kind of like, I just, <laughs> I just couldn't do it. And that's what my biggest thing about, I know I can say for man, for man, for man, but it's because growing up, right, I knew a few girls who converted religion and all of a sudden it was like this what big 180 and they were doing it for man. And I was always so confused because I'm like, you know, we're 17, like, I don't, yeah. at 17, I hadn't even really figured out my faith like that, let alone for me to go pick up a whole new faith because a cute boy, you know, was telling me about it and what wants us to be committed. Like, it just didn't feel real to me. So I've always been under the thing, like, I'm not sure how real it is. I mean, I could speak for my old sister. It's not really religion, but more denomination. Like, we were Pentecostal, but she's now Catholic because her husband's Catholic. But that wasn't too far of a stretch for her to yeah. kind of, like, change, you know what I mean? And she- Well, not in this century. Yeah, 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 not in this century. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely not in this century. And she was, and she genuinely believed in those ideals and things, and she came to that of her own. So unless I had honestly come to it of my own is the only way in which I would do it. But nobody could sit me down and have a conversation and me be very persuaded to do it. Like, I could, I could yeah. not. But I yeah. am a bit different to you, so, well, I guess, yeah, I'm still on the fence, but I'm a bit different to you, Sophie, because you know you said you wouldn't date someone outside of your religion. I'm kind of like on the fence about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Do you know what? I'm on the fence I was about on it. the fence about it until I started dating my husband. So before mm. that, I'm just kind of like someone who is like, I believe in God and is like, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Yeah, I'm open to that. But I think when I got with my husband and we're of the same faith, the same denomination, I realised how important it was to have somebody who took it as seriously as I did mm. so that if I feel stressed or upset, he doesn't feel a way to pray with me or to share that with me or to read the Bible with me in order for us to feel encouraged. And I realised actually, if I had dated somebody who was just like, I don't really care and I wasn't able to share a part of my life that was so big, it would have made certain situations within my life difficult. Not to say that people can't do it because I read an article that was talking about some people change or convert to different religions for their spouse because they see the beauty of it. They see mm. what their spouse is involved in and they're kind of like, wow, it's so beautiful. I really love what the core values are and what the practices are and I want to be a part of it. So, but all the, correct me if I'm wrong ladies, but all the things I've read about it, why does it always seem like it's women converting for men? Always, always, always the compromise. And never that's what got me. I never saw no man that's like, let me give up Jesus for you and become yeah. a Jew. I was just Real. like, what? Real. It's, it's really frustrating. But I think, um, like, it's, I think the, the, the quick answer is because the, the, the more oppressed person is always the one oh, compromising. Boy. Like we have a conversation <laughs> about like Come oh, through the one that we missed oh, this God. oppression talk this week. No, it's Come just, through the way. Don't finish me today. Please. Because, because, because as black people we're like, shall we compromise the culture when we go into work? Shall I not rap Jay Z? Shall I straighten my hair? And yeah, then as yeah, women yeah. we're like, shall I compromise my family? Shall I do that? So it it's that's the short answer to it. But um Anisa you said something about, you know, 
it being disingenuine and that would yeah. also be something that bothers me because if yeah. you really wholeheartedly believe in this religion wouldn't you want me to find my way there myself wouldn't yeah. you want mm -hmm. um it to be as genuine with me as it is with you instead of us doing it to shut your family up or to to be married in the same temple because yeah. i can't <laughs> convincingly believe like i can't you know i can't <laughs> convince anyone that i believe in something that i don't believe in you know so well i mean i could but i'm not going to that's no. the thing and <laughs> and i think that the only time that i would compromise or consider converting to a religion would be if it was Buddhism and obviously I don't know all the ins and outs of Buddhism at present because I don't like have that many Buddhists close to me in my personal life and I don't know um, like that much about it objectively but from what I do mm -hmm. know it seems like a religion based on compassion based on not harming your body based on not harming anything that's living it's one of the few or one of the only major religions that isn't centered around a god it's centered around humans it is like a self-empowering religion it teaches us about um killing our ego and putting away greed and finding like a more humble existence. So they're just, so far everything that I've learned about it is something that I like. They don't pray, but they meditate and they contemplate on introspection, which is something that I already strongly believe in. So I don't think it would be too much of a leap for like, for me, you like as a spiritual person, yeah, to go to yeah. being a Buddhist. Yeah. If I learn more about it and everything makes as much sense as the things that I do know already make to me right now, then I'd be like, okay, let's let's be Buddhist. Yeah. And on the note of choice, um, thank you for watching and listening to another episode of Ethnically Speaking. We hope you have enjoyed it as much as we have enjoyed talking. If you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a thing. And if you would like a summary of everything that we've spoken about this episode, head on over to unitedmelaningroup.com forward slash ES014. Like the video on whichever platform you are receiving us and let's keep the conversation going. Would you convert to another religion for the person that you loved? Drop us a comment in the comments section below mm -hmm. and we will see you same time, same place next week. Stay safe and stay alert.